Hey, so before we get onto the episode, I want to quickly say two things. One thing that I will be um, dropping back to one video slash podcast for every week. So I'll be posting that every single Wednesday. And the second thing is that you guys should definitely check out a podcast that I was featured in. It's called The 600 Second Show. Definitely check it out. I have it linked in the show notes or in my description box. And I had so much fun um, being on there and talking all about my career as a YouTuber and writer. I really encourage you guys to check that one out. And let's go ahead and get on to the episode. Hey, Riley Besties. Welcome back to the Rain Without a New Podcast, where we talk about all the things writing in today's episode. I'm actually going to be reading to you one of my short stories. And the this is actually a short story that I um, submitted to a sort of literary slash creative writing um, competition. So... I had so much fun writing this story as well. I didn't get like an award or anything or I didn't win, but I did get through like the main round. Um, But then I got that little email back saying I didn't make it, but it's totally fine. I was just really excited to simply submit it and get my work out there and just kind of have this little challenge where I wrote this short story in like three days. Um, I do a vlog on it, by the way, if you guys want to check that out, I'll have it linked in the iCard if you are watching on my YouTube video uh yeah podcast but I'm gonna go ahead and um read it to you so let's go ahead and get into it so this story is called the sculptor Alrighty, so it starts off like this who is she the girl's mother whispers looking ahead at the carved marble a face with cheeks a face with wide eyes a face of beauty the girl leans her head to the side reaching out her small, steady hands to cup the jaw of the statue's head. I don't know, Mama, the girl murmurs, blinking. I don't know. And there's kind of like an interlude, you know, when there's like the little dots um, to separate the scene. Anyways, um, yeah. (laughs) From youth, Daria McClave's parents noticed their daughter's silent interest in the arts. With their deep pockets and deeper love for the single child, Daria grew to chip at the rock of her curiosity. It revealed skill more so than imagination. At 16, the critics claimed that the child's talent was too big for America. She was sent by ship to the University of London, where she stayed long years after graduation in a small apartment where she would wake, drink milk tea, sculpt and sleep. A quiet life, some would say, when she would sit on her windowsill till sunset. A life of dreams and arts, others would say, when she was posted in newspapers and pressed for awkward interviews. Daria thought that too for a while. She thought that too. The sun pours into Daria's apartment, casting shadows around the statues that sit upon oak dresses hanging from shelves that are nailed awkwardly into the smooth walls. She gets up and washes her face, her body moving methodically like stone. She holds tea in her chaffed, cut hands as she wanders with bare feet through the silent apartment. The footsteps of the bakers and the roll of early carts are the only thing alive outside with the Jew. Daria sits upon her stool and stares at the half-finished sculptor in front of her. The same face she's carved. The same face that surfaces after every chip of her pitching chisel. The same face for years. Daria could never name the face, because she didn't know her. She sets her tea down to be forgotten and picks up her small mullet and chisel to begin working. She barely breathes as she breaks away the stone in slow chips, hearing the familiar chink and crack of the marble crumble and fall to the carpet beneath her feet. It could have been hours before she jumped at a knock at the door. It was a postman who greeted her with a letter, the script clean and sharp, and familiar. She was about to say thank you when the man disappeared. Sitting back on her stool, she sliced the paper open with her chisel and read what it contained. Dear Daria V. McClave, we are in great hopes that you've overcome your insistent sickness of two months and have completed the memorial sculptor of Jeremy Betham for London University. Out of excited curiosity, we will overview this commission the morning of August 29th at your studio, Marks Littlethorne, President of the Arts. Daria looks up to a shelf where each sculptor's head is turned around. I've been trying, she thinks. My hands just won't let me. She did try. 
She's been trying for six months, but every chisel and chip, every crack has led her back to the same face that stares at her now. People thought she chose only to sculpt this face, an artistic choice. Choice. She wonders what that word really means. The woman's face she's carved so many times is imprinted not so much in her mind, but in her hands, as if she knows this face more so than her own. It is as natural as it is for one to sign their own signature, or crack their tight knuckles. Daria gazes at the face, discarding the letter to hold the stone's high cheekbones, trace the rivets of her skin, feeling the crevices of her eyes that have stared at her for what seemed her whole life. Who are you? Daria whispers, her throat closing in on her words. Where have I seen you? Why are you always here? The marble figure just stares back at her, with an odd defiance Daria's critics have written about. But the crease at her brow and the downturn of the same lips she's carved forever is different. The same face. A different expression. Desperation. Daria realises. That night Daria sleeps, but she dreams so vividly it doesn't feel like sleeping at all. The clashing of waves, the drum of battle cries, a boat sinking. Daria looks around her, the sky open like a thundering dome, a snow globe of storm clouds. It looks like rain in heaven. Her feet topple, but she's memorised her steps, letting the creak and sway of the boat propel her across the deck of the ship. Her head is wet and whipping, her eyes are bloodshot, blood mixes with river water seeming like watered down wine that runs and drips over the deck, a pool of glistening rubies. Mother! A girl's voice rings out like a million bells, a million hopeless bells. Sticks, save us! Men shout, for God's sake! Daria forces her knees down and claws at her ears, dreading what comes next. She whines as a thundering boom sounds beneath the ship, bursts of river water shooting up on both sides, drenching the sails black. Mother! The same voice calls above the quake of the earth and river. Mother, don't leave me! Daria feels a cold burning at her legs. She looks down to see the water rising, the ship sinking. Every warrior stripped of their armor clamors with cries of hell, staggering to the hole. Hands grappling at nothing. A dreamer cries, unable to decipher tears from rain as she hoists her body up, the breaking ship. Feeling splinters slide under her shins and through the skin of her hands. She's never got this far and for a hopeful moment she thinks she's made it to the hull where the insistent cries of a maiden coaxes her leaden body towards her. Daria grunts and pulls herself up. Seen for a moment a green hill through the mist and storm, she finally sees who the voice belongs to, and for a moment the blurry figure looks back at her. Louvre, she seems to say over and over. Louvre, save me, Louvre. The voice cuts through Daria's ears, resounding in her own throat. Daria hears herself repeating the same word into the vacant night, but her whispers don't feel so lonely anymore. Mark Littlethorne knocks on the sculptor's door early the next morning, a knock that goes unanswered. So he calls. It's harder, but no one comes to the door. By train, ferry, foot, Daria stands at the front of the Louvre Museum in Paris. Reflective lights bounce off the Louvre Pyramid. Mirrors of nothing. Daria walks past this and past the crowd of trench coats and top hats too, she walks into the museum with one shuddering breath. Sandstone walls protrude from every side as her head lifts to encompass the entry hall, remembering her first visit with her mother and father, when her hands were smaller, where the skin of her fingers were unbroken and soft, when she was smiling. Daria's hands stay twitching at her side, her feet forgetting their heaviness. She wasn't sure why she came here. She only knew that she needed to. She didn't know why she needed to. But the paintings, the sculptors, the languages of mind and music led her through each room. 
She would pause and read the plaques next to each piece, feeling as she did when she was a little girl, that every piece already existed. Each image was already in the world. It simply mattered who chose to create it. A harrowing piece, isn't it? An old man adjusted his spectacle, his eye squinting at the raft of the Medusa. Daria remained quiet beside the grain man. She gazed at the starving, hopeless men lying upon the broken timber, a raft caught between the white teeth of wave and foam. A few men outstretched their arms with the white pieces of rippling cloth, likely stripped from their own bodies. The sea swallows their eyes. Some people are dying for hope, others dying from it. It reminded Daria of her dreams. Although controversial, the man continued, sticking out his pen to write on a leather-bound note, it's as if there could be two sides of the same story, Daria whispers. The old man side-eyes her with a jut of his stubbled jaw. Indeed, do they get saved or do they die? Daria blinks and turns away, unable to look at the painting anymore. It could have been hours before she found it. Turning a corner, a white figure was mounted in the sky, the sole lonely figure in the room. Daria stands before the master staircase, her heart beating with a sudden memory. The sculptor remembers getting lost when she last visited that one time with her parents. She went ahead, strayed from them, disappearing in the tide of lakes and leather. But when she found this room... When she found this sculptor standing upon her throne, she stayed, and for a moment she wondered why she'd forgotten. The winged sculpture stood upon a pointed structure, the mosaic windows cascading swells of light upon her, as if she stood just below heaven's gaze. Daria's legs moved slowly to a plaque against the far wall. It wasn't something she recognized then, but she reads it now, slowly, in her mind. The winged victory of Samothrace. Nike is the winged goddess of the victory in war. Under Zeus, during the Titan War, Styx offered her four children to him, including her loved daughter, Nike. The 18-foot sculptor portrays Nike in a wet, wind-blown drapery that clings to her skin. She stands forward toward the front of a ship to commemorate a victorious sea battle. Dara's eyes sweep to behold the winged woman being looked at by passerbyers, their sockets holding woolly eyes, because she was incomplete, broken. Daria looks back to the plaque, her eyes skittering over words, sticks, victory, sea, wind, wings. Why didn't you fly away? The sculptor thinks, looking up to her. She wonders what made her younger self sit here, cross-legged on the floor, why she was so enthralled, enchanted. Was it because she had no arms? Was it because she had no face? No face to forget? And no face to remember either? Daria looks at her, and she sees the crowd blur and quicken in her peripheral vision. She stands there like a ghost, still, staring, until she is the only one left in the hall before the great statue of Nike, until the light faded into moonshine, until her heart forgot why it should breathe. After standing there so long, she finally takes a step, climbing the grand white staircase as if she was ascending somewhere higher than cloud or sky. But once she took that step, she stumbled, feeling some overwhelming rumble of power beneath her heels, deep beneath the stone floors. The walls begin to shake, and she begins to smell salt and wind. Daria looks to the left, and she can't even scream. She sees a wave of water swishing down the left hall, its foam white and frothing, drenching the air in mist, waves that reach the ceiling. Battle cries resound off every wall, the sound breaking and muffled. Daria's feet turn cold. Salty spray wets her skin, and she slips, Running up the staircase, a cry claws up her throat, but it never leaves her lips, and she runs, feeling the river's wave press at her back, the cries of men assaulting her ears as she makes it to the winged giant. I'm here, she yells, 
throwing herself upon Nike, wrapping her slippery hands around her stone waist. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Her voice is lost in the wind, her eyes stained from stinging tears. I know you, Daria sobs. I know you now. You can stop. Please stop. But it did not stop, and she didn't hear the maiden's voice. Just fly, Daria weeps. Fly away. Daria McClave drowned on August 29th, 1996, at 23 years old. Medical professionals couldn't explain how she drowned in a museum, nor why her face and arms were gone. <laughs> wow. That's my my little story. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I remember writing this and being just like so shocked. I literally like cried at that last sentence. No why no nor why her face and arms were gone. It's insane. I was not expecting it to be so morbid. Um, but that's the uh episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I definitely want to read more stuff of my own stories and stuff like that um hopefully in the future so let me know if you guys want that um but thank you so much for listening to the whole story it truly means so so much and i hope you enjoyed it um sorry if i had to like cut a lot of yeah cut it up because it's really hard to kind of go without messing up but yeah i love you guys and i hope to see you in my next writing video bye guys